work at the Institute of Healthy Aging at UCL and what we're interested in is understanding how the aging process itself works and how diseases associated with aging develop. In particular, I'm interested in dementia research. Uh, dementia is a disease caused by the death of cells in the brain and what I'm interested in is to try and understand how does this develop using fruit flies to try and work out disease mechanisms. Dementia, people don't realise, is actually the most common cause of death within the UK. There's a lot less funding to do with dementia, which means there's a lot less research. And this means that there's currently no cures. So there's a great, it's an important scientific mm. question and currently under-researched and under-discovered. Okay. And why using fruit flies to study a human disease? I mean, do flies have dementia? Flies don't have dementia. However, they're very similar to humans. 75% of diseases associated genes have an equivalent in fruit flies. Okay. But they don't have the disease, they have the genes. They have the genes and what we know from humans is what genes actually lead to disease development. Mm. So I can take the gene from the human, put this into flies and then analyze disease mechanisms, which often are very similar. Okay. And why, why, what are the advantages of using a model system like fruit flies? So fruit flies are very cheap, they have a very rapid life cycle, so I can grow in bulk large number of flies very quickly, which means I can run experiments with statistically significant numbers. They're also very cheap, so I can do a, number, a large number of experiments all in parallel, which allows me to go through a variety of possibilities quickly. And then my findings get passed on to people working on more sophisticated, higher organisms like mice or human cells, and they can verify my findings. Flies are still very different from humans. Flies are surprisingly similar to humans, actually. As I said, 75% of genes associated with human disease have an equivalent with flies. Fly brains have similar cell structures to a human brain. And so a lot of the ways cells interact with each other are actually very similar. So can we have a look at these flies? Yes. Okay. So we're now in the fly lab, okay, and uh, you use flies to study dementia. How exactly do you do that? So what we do is we take fruit flies and we can grow them in bottles or vials and what we have we feed them a mix of yeast sugar and water the flies will lay eggs on the surface when they hatch the larvae burrow down when the larvae are big enough they crawl up they form pupae and the fly then hatches and it takes about 10 days from the time that the fly lays an egg to get a full adult so it's a very rapid life cycle and the lifespan of a fly, even in the best of conditions, is only about three months, which allows us to follow the whole of disease development throughout the lifespan of the organism. Okay, so this is another advantage of flies, because if you, had, if you wanted to study the disease progression from the beginning until the death, basically, in another organism, I guess it would be much longer. Yes, in mice this would take about three years. So three years to do an experiment <laughs> that you can do in ten days in flies. Three months in flies, months. so the whole lifespan in yes. a fly will be about three months. When in the disease models, this is much, much quicker, so it's either 20 days to about 50 days. So it's really rapid relative to other organisms. So flies don't have dementia, so how do you study this? this so organism? flies don't have dementia, so we can ask actually very precise questions. We can look at genes that have been associated with disease development in humans, and what we can do is we can take that gene and actually put it within the fly genes, and then turn on that gene whenever we need it and we normally do this once the flies have become an adult which means we're only looking at adult uh, effects and so we can give them diseases that have been associated with Alzheimer's or frontotemporal dementia. So you take the human gene and you insert it into flies and yeah. you see the same sort of well we can't call them symptoms but the same sort of effects at the cellular level. Yes so the disease both Alzheimer's and frontotemporal dementia lead to the death of uh, neurons, so brain cells, and the same thing happens in flies. Okay. The brain cells don't work as well, and this leads to certain symptoms to flies. Okay. okay, so imagine you find a gene that makes the disease better. What do you do then? Because I guess the ultimate goal is to, you know, uh, find a new drug target or understand what's happening in humans. So in flies, what's very easy is to understand the cellular mechanism. So we can look to some extent what this particular gene is doing, how is it making disease better. Then we pass on these findings to people working on human neurons, for example. There's a lot of labs now working on patient-derived 
human neurons or in mouse models, where it's actually quite difficult to broadly look at the vast array of possibilities, which is what we can do in flies, but they can confirm what we found in flies to see if the same applies to a higher system. Okay, so collaboration is quite important, would you say? It accelerates science? It's fundamental since obviously what happens in flies can't be directly applicable to humans and you specialize within your particular model organism because there's a lot of techniques that are very specific and nobody can know everything. So it's better that mm. different groups do what they're good at and then you come together on particular topics. And it seems to be working. It works very well. We've already had a very fruitful collaboration with Isaacs for years now. With Francis Weisman, we're just going to start a project in September, so I'm very excited to see how that develops. So you had quite an unusual career path because you had a career break when you had your children. So why did you decide to take a career break and when did you do it in your career? So while I was doing my PhD, one of the postdocs that was working there, one of the very senior postdocs, told me that she had taken a career break during her life and she never regretted having it. So what I did is I finished my PhD, I then took on a first postdoc in Cambridge and after about three years I decided to take a career break when my first son arrived. Then I had another son about two and a half years later and I went back to work when the elder one was five and the younger one was two and a half years old. Okay, so you took a five year career break after your postdoc? Yes. Eventually I decided when the kids were probably about four, when the older one was four, that I wanted to go back. And it took about a year to find a suitable a job year. that I could start up again. So it was difficult to, come, to go back to academia? It was difficult mostly because I say it's quite rare, so people weren't prepared, mm. they didn't quite know what to make of me. Although I, would, I was coming from very good labs, I didn't have publications from my postdoc, which means applying for career re-entry grants was difficult. There are a whole host of career re-entry okay, grants. Okay, so there are grants specifically for women wanting to go back? There are. Okay. There's some excellent programs in the UK. And at least in the UK? At least in the UK. I don't know about the rest of the world. So there are c programs that will help you go back into science. And if you have your own funding, any lab will take you. Mm. However, that wasn't an option for me because I didn't have mm. publications from my first mm. postdoc. So it took a while to find the lab. And then eventually, Linda Partridge uh, took me on to work on dementia in fruit flies. Okay. So what advice would you give to women considering having a career break when they have children? Well, I think you can't exactly plan when is the perfect time. You have to work within how you're doing, where your life is at. I think any career stage is suitable. I think it works better if you're within a, a time, so at the end of your PhD so, or at the end of your mm. first postdoc. And what I would advise is to make sure that you finish whatever work you're currently producing so that you have a publication so that you can show something for your career up to that point. And to get a grant, I guess. And you you'll be, I mean, you yeah. then you'll be eligible for grants going back into science. And if you can get money, it's very easy to find a lab mm. that will take you. And how do you cope? I mean, how do you balance family life and career? It gets easier, so both boys will be in secondary school from September, which means they take themselves to school, they come home, mm. the elder one takes himself to friends, can get the bus, the tube on his own. So it becomes progressively easier and actually infinitely easier once the kids can get themselves to places. When the children were younger, it was harder, mm. but I had a lot of support from a lot of family and we always had an au pair living in with us. Okay, so you think support was essential? Flexible support is essential. So science is very good in that you can take days off or half days off in case your kids are ill. Mm. You can run away at the last minute. You don't have clients. So it's actually very suitable as time-wise to having a family. However, you do need a large number of hours to actually get through the bulk of the work. Mm. So, you need some, yeah. so you do need somebody that can cover for when you need to be in the lab. If your children would tell you that they want to be a scientist, what would you say? I'd encourage them. I think it's a good career. TimeWise is very good on a day-to-day -day basis. It's extremely flexible. People you work with are really nice. Most people are doing it because they enjoy the science. The money's not great, so you have to do it because mm. you, you like be what you're doing. It. Yes, which does make for a very friendly 
environment. Universities are very nice also because you've got a lot of young people enthusiastic around you, which is quite nice to feed off their enthusiasm. And if you like it, it's definitely very rewarding. And I guess if you work with disease, it's even more rewarding. Yes, and there's a very small chance of making a very huge difference, but some scientists manage to actually cure disease, and that would be very satisfying. And on that positive note, I'd like to thank you for giving me in this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you.